Hey everyone! Today's tutorial is a little bit special because it covers an effect that has been part of my Godot shader pack for several weeks now. However, I believe it deserves a more detailed explanation for those who not only want to use this shader, but also understand how it works. So let's get into it. As we saw at the beginning of the video, this shader belongs to the category of effects that handle smooth transitions from one image to another. The only requirement is that both images have the same dimensions, which isn't a big issue when it comes to scene backgrounds in a game. So I'll create a new 2D scene and insert a typical screenshot from our game, to which we'll then assign the new shader. Let me do that. Right click on the scene, create new scene and call it a ripple, for example, and it's a 2D scene. Okay, and here is the fountain JPEG. This is the image. I'll drag it to the scene. So the sprite 2D sprite 2D node was automatically created. And let's do the usual stuff in the offset, cancel centered and uh, transform reset to zero zero and scroll down to the material section here a new shader material click new shader ripple gd shader of the canvas item type and shader of course and let's put it to the shaders folder create click again to open in the in the shader editor all right, and we'll go through the usual setup, which involves delete, deleting the unnecessary code so that we are left with just a fragment function. I am deleting vertex and I am deleting light. Cool. Uh, so the shader will have several uniform parameters so that we can configure it as needed. The first and the most important one will be the second image, which we'll be transforming into uniform sampler 2D second texture. And let's give it hint default black. So in case there is no second image, we'll be transferring simply to a black background. Next, we need to define the actual structure of this transition. It will be controlled by a total of five parameters, speed, frequency, period, fade, and displacement. I'll add them to the code and gradually see, we'll gradually see how they are used in the algorithm. So uniform float speed with a hint range the default value is two, and I think the hint range I set to from uh, zero to 10, and now uniform float frequency, let's call it just frec, another hint range and starts at 10, and this time it can go from zero to 20. The third one is uniform float, period, a hint range, and the period should be 8 seconds, and from point 0.1 to, let's say, 20 again, uh, the next one is uniform float fade, and a hint range as well, and it should start at 4, and let's make it from point one to ten and finally the displacement uniform float disp for displacement with a hint range and this one should start at point two and let's make it from uh, zero to one with point zero one as a range okay now let's move on to the fragment function our ripple effect will originate from the center, from the center of the 
uh, of the image and spread in circular waves. So we need to prepare by shifting the coordinate origin to the center and recalculating the aspect ratio. This time the shader is applied to an image, so we can use the built-in variable texture pixel size like this. So vec2 resolution is 1 divided by texture pixel size. This gives us the dimensions of the of the image and we can use it to recalculate the aspect ratio but first uv is uv minus 0.5 so we move the origin to the center and now the aspect ratio uvx is multiplied by resolution x divided by resolution y all right, next we'll define a time variable, which we usually calculate by multiplying the built-in time by the speed parameter. However, this time we're working with a periodic effect, so we'll also use the per period parameter and the module of function to make the values repeat regularly. Like this, float full time is modulo time times speed and period. Okay, as we may have noticed, the effect is in this form, transform the first image into the second and then back to the first and repeats this endlessly. So to determine the duration of the entire period, that is there and back, we'll introduce one more variable and call it double time. And it's again modulo time times speed, but this time twice the period times two. Okay. Of course, if we wanted to perform just a single transition in our game, we could skip these time related uh, variables and instead control the period parameter from GDScript, smoothly changing it from zero to its maximum value. However, uh, let's continue. We've defined the period and now we need to determine the distance of the current pixel from the center of the effect. That's easy because at the center we have coordinates 0, 0. So we just need to get the length of the UV vector. Float pixel distance is length, <laughs> length of UV. All right, now we can determine the distance between the wave, which changes over time and forms the basis of our effect, and the current pixel. Since this value could be negative, we will just clamp it to zero using the max function. Float wave distance is maximum of zero and full time minus uh, pixel distance. Cool. Eh, this one. Next, we are interested in the height of the wave at the given distance. We'll use the cosine function, which is periodic and takes on values in the range of negative 1 to 1. The frequency of this function will be determined by the frec parameter, this one. And we'll remap the result to the range from 0 to 1. Float. Wave height is cosine of wave distance times frequency and now the remapping. So multiplying by 0.5 uh, gives us from negative 0.5 to 0.5. And now if we just add 0.5, this is from 0 to 1. In addition, we want the image to gradually transition into the second one as the time progresses within the period. We'll control this using the fade parameter. Using the fade parameter. And first, we need to determine how to change the wave's intensity at the distance from the center as the distance from the center increases. Wave scale is 1 minus minimum. So this time we are clamping at the top. It never exceeds the 1 
the value 1 and the wave distance divided by fade. Okay, and finally, the actual transformation, which will also occur periodically, this time using the sign function. So we start from zero. Float wave fade is sign of wave distance times frequency and again divided by the fade value. Great, so we have everything we need to compute the transformation using these parameters. First, we'll calculate the weight coefficient for the final mix of both images. It will change over time and will reverse direction for the return transition. So first float, weight uh, equals wave height times wave scale and now for the reverse direction so if double time is greater than period which happens exactly the half of the time uh, weight is a simply one minus weight the opposite direction all right, and now we also need an offset to simulate a wavy surface. We'll then use it to determine the correct pixel from the image. Let's add it here. Vec2 offset is UV times wave scale times wave fade. This is some multiplication times displacement, disp and divided by pixel distance. Very well. All that's left is to display the result using the mix function, which works as a linear interpolation, just like the LARP function in GDScript. So final color is a mix between the first image, texture of our texture, and UV coordinates. This is important to use the capital UV. So it, before applying the aspect ratio, otherwise the uh, the effect wouldn't work correctly. Would be using only a part of the image, or it would be deformed. Plus offset. This is the basis of the of the effect. Then the second image texture of the second texture and again uv in capital letters plus offset and uh, weight factor wait for it okay here we go let's take a look at the bigger image we are done we can now preview the result and experiment with the parameter settings. So let's open them in the shader parameters. And let's try, for example, faster speed. Yeah, this is pretty, pretty fast. So you can put it to a full stop and nothing is happening. Let's get back to the original value. And now the frequency. Uh, wait a minute. Ah. Of course, we don't have the second texture. Sorry about that. Let's drag, for example, this one, as we we could have seen in the uh, at the beginning of the video. Now it is correct. Sorry about that. So let's change the frequency, make it faster. Now it looks completely different, especially if the frequency is lower. This is a very slow wave. Okay, how about the period? Let's make it faster. And the fade, I think it affects the blending effect at all. Now it's very low. If we put it to the minimum value, it's a completely different one. Yeah, and what if we put it to the maximum? Very well. What about the displacement? This is a zero displacement. Displacement again, a completely different, or the maximum one. Now it's very surrealistic. 
Okay, I guess that could be enough. Thank you very much for watching. This tutorial was a bit shorter, but it certainly didn't make the final effect any less interesting. Of course, circular waves aren't always the right choice, but if we wanted elliptical ones instead, we just need to comment out the line that adjusts the aspect ratio. And as we saw during the final experiments with the parameters, this effect can take on several different forms, which makes it a very useful shader. If you use it in your game, I'd be very pleased. In any case, take care, good luck with your projects, and I'll see you in the next video.